Section 13. We must go yet more deeply into the nature of the church as being not a mere chance union of Christians, but as a society divinely constituted and wonderfully organized, having as its direct object to bestow peace and holiness on the soul, and since for this end it alone, by divine gift, possesses the necessary means, it has fixed laws, fixed functions, and in the direction of Christian peoples, follows a method most consonant with its nature. But the course of its government is difficult and seldom runs smooth. The church is the mistress of nations scattered over the whole earth, differing in race and customs, whose duty it is, living each in its own state under its own laws, to submit both to civil and ecclesiastical power. And these duties are incumbent on the same persons, and not at odds with each other nor confused, as we have said, for the former promotes the prosperity of the state, the latter the common good of the church, and both are for the perfection of man. Section 14. And with this definition of mutual rights and functions, it is clear that rulers of states should be free to guide their affairs, and this not only without the opposition, but with the assistance of the church. For since she above all things teaches the practice of piety, which is justice towards God, in the same way she urges men to act with justice towards their rulers. But the ecclesiastical power has this far nobler aim, to rule the minds of men by having regard to the kingdom of God and his justice, Matthew 6.33, and is entirely devoted to this object. Moreover, it cannot without rashness be doubted that the direction of souls has been given to the church alone, so that in it political power has no right of interference. For not to Caesar, but to Peter, did Jesus Christ entrust the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And with this doctrine on political and religious affairs are bound up matters of considerable moment, on which we would not be silent in this place. Section 15. From all political society, the Christian church differs widely. If upon its face there rests the likeness and shadow of a kingdom, it has in truth an origin, a motive, an essence very remote from the kingdoms of this world. It is fitting that the church should live and protect herself by institutions and laws that are in harmony with her nature. And since her society is not only perfect, but it is also placed above every human society, she, in the fulfillment of her right and her office, firmly refuses to side with any parties and to bend the knee to the fleeting and changeable politics of the civil order. And in like manner, while being the guardian of her rights and most careful against encroachment, the church has no care what form of government exists in a state or by what customs the civil order of Christians and Christian nations is directed. Of the various kinds of government, there is none of which she disapproves, so long as religion and moral discipline live untouched. It is befitting that the thoughts and action of all Christians should be pointed towards this example. We cannot doubt that in the political world there is an honorable strife, when under the principles of truth and justice, men endeavor to make those opinions prevail which conduce most to the common good. But to sully the church by party strife, or to desire to make her an ally in overcoming opponents in such strife, would be the work of men who rashly abuse religion. On the contrary, religion should be held sacred and immaculate by all. In the very enforcement of state discipline, a matter impossible to be separated from the laws and duties of religion, the interests of Christianity should particularly be borne in mind. And wherever these should seem to be in danger from the attacks of opponents, all strife must be stopped and the defense of religion undertaken in full agreement together, since religion is the highest good of the community by which every act should be regulated. We think it necessary to expound this somewhat more carefully. Section 16. In truth, both church and state have each an individual domain. Wherefore, in fulfilling their separate duties, neither is subject to the other, within the limits fixed by their boundary lines, from which, nevertheless, it follows that they are by no means things with separate and distinct aims, 
much less that they are in mutual warfare. Indeed, nature not only gives us existence, but bade us also dwell together, and hence a man has a right to demand of a state at peace with itself, which is the immediate object of the civil bond, that it should be a benefactor to him, and much more that it should give efficient means for enforcing purity of morals, which consists only in the knowledge and exercise of virtue. At the same time, he desires, as is right, to find assistance in the church towards winning the perfect gift of a perfect piety, which consists in the knowledge and practice of true religion, the mother of all virtues, since by referring man to God, she fulfills and compasses them all. In sanctioning institutions and laws, man's moral and religious character should be regarded, and his perfection sought after rightly in due order, nor should anything be commanded or forbidden unless on the ground of benefit to the civil society and in accordance with religion. For this reason, the church cannot but concern herself about the laws formulated in states, not for their connection with the government, but because they sometimes encroach on the right of the church by passing their due boundaries. Nay, it is a duty assigned by God to the church to make resistance, if at any time the state does harm to religion, and to strive that the virtue of the gospel shall influence the laws and institutions of the people. And since the welfare of the state is peculiarly dependent on the direction of its governors, the church cannot give either patronage or favor to the men at whose hands she knows only oppression, who in the broad day refuse to respect her rights, and who strive to tear asunder civil and sacred polity, bound together as they are in their very essence. On the other hand, she is, as she should be, the defender of those who, justly appreciating what is due to the civil and Christian state, desire to work peacefully for the common good of both. In these precepts is contained the rule which all Catholics should follow in public life, and it should be remembered that whenever the Church is lawfully brought into connection with public affairs, those men should receive favor who are of known honesty and are likely to deserve well of the Christian name. Nor is there the least reason why men should be preferred who are filled with evil intentions against religion. Section 17. Hence the importance of the duty to guide the minds of men becomes clear, particularly when in these days Christianity is plotted against with such a depth of cunning. Those who desire honestly to abide by the church, which is the pillar and firmament of truth, 1 Timothy 3.15, will easily be on their guard against lying teachers, promising them liberty, being themselves slaves of corruption, 2 Peter 2, 119. They will become partners in the power of the church, and they will overcome snares by fortitude. We shall not here inquire how far the sloth and intestine discord of Catholics have worked in the interests of revolution. But this may be said, that evil men would have been less prompt in boldness, less ready to work so great a ruin, if the faith that works by charity, Galatians 5, 6, had been stronger in the minds of many, nor would the discipline of Christianity, entrusted to us from on high, have fallen so low in the world. May the past work this benefit that, by remembrance of it, men may learn to be wiser for the future. <laughs>